Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Randwick CD Library Live and Online. My name is Georgina Keith, and I'm the Local Studies Librarian at Randwick City Library. It gives me great pleasure to open our local history talk tonight. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which Randwick City Library stands, and also wherever each of us are located today. I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I have a few technical housekeeping tips for those of you who may not have joined us in our events online before this evening. The best part about using Zoom is our ability for you, our community, to engage with our guest speaker directly. There will be time for a Q&A towards the end of this presentation. So if you can type your question at any time during the presentation, when Christine has finished, I will put your questions to her um, for as many as we have time to cover. Right now though, everyone's sound and video has been disabled and this will remain that way for the duration of the event. You will not be able to activate these features throughout the event. And at the very end of our presentation, we will show you a brief survey poll to get your feedback about today's event. We would be grateful if you could fill it out so we can plan and improve on future events. Tonight though, we are delighted to welcome Christine Yates. I first met Christine as a member of the Australian Society of Archivists, too long ago to mention and be fair to either of us really. In her professional life, Christine has had an illustrious career in managing archives administration with the New South Wales government. She is a professional historian, former past president of both the Royal Australian Historical Society and the Randwick and District Historical Society. She is also a published author in numerous academic and professional journals. Ultimately though, it is Christine's passion for history and particularly Randwick's local history that has seen our paths continue, continue to cross over many years. Tonight, I'm looking forward to hosting Christine as she shares her research on the Coogee Mardi Gras of 1959. Good evening and welcome, Christine. How are you this evening? Thank you very much. I'm very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I will let you get on with it. And when you're finished, we'll have some questions for you, I am sure. So we're looking forward to a gentle distraction after what hasn't been a very pleasant day in the news front. So I'll talk to you later on. Okay, Thank you. Right. Good evening, everyone. It's a delight to be here, and thank you very much for the introduction, Georgina. I would too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which I'm uh, meeting tonight with you, the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Tonight, we're going to talk about um, an event which I suspect many of you um, will know of or will remember either from family or friends. In almost every community, there is an event, such as to the one I'm going to speak about, that's remembered. Some, of course, are very positive, very positive childhood memories. Others cast a long shadow over a community and the families who lived through the event. For long-term residents of Coogee, uh, the event, uh, the collapse of the Ferris wheel at Coogee on the 1st of January, 1959, is one such event. Now, when I talked about this, um, and I gave a talk about this quite a few years ago now, I realised quite a few years ago, um, I was delighted, but also very, uh, I felt quite sad, really, because uh, one of the participants in the audience came up to me later, and he was the son of an ambulance um, officer who had been around at the time of the uh, Ferris wheel collapse. And um, the man said to me that his father, Bob Menger, a Bill, Bill Menger, I beg your pardon, um, was never the same afterwards, the effect that it had on his life. And I'm sure that will be the same for many others. Now, um, everything was looking terif terrific, all very optimistic. The Weekly Courier uh, reported that the centenary celebrations would commence 
with the Mardi Gras at Coogee Beach. Uh, it was going to be a grand event with, uh, you can read there, with a mix of overseas entertainers, rides, the Ferris wheels, of course. And as had been the tradition for a very long time, the, uh, the money would go to charities in the, muni the Randwick municipality. And 59, 1959 was the 100th anniversary year of uh, Randwick being declared a municipality, and that was gazetted on the 22nd of February, for those who collect trivia. Um, now, looking back, um, there was a long, long tradition of having events down at Coogee Beach, as we uh, probably people will remember from photos and so on. The trams went all the way down to the beach. Um, and there were events and activities associated with the aquarium um, right for a very long time. Um, and there were uh, that photo, which is I have taken it from uh, Randwick of Social History. Um, I can't get a clearer one, unfortunately, but it shows uh, the Coogee Fairground around about 1910. I suspect that that was part of the activities associated with the Coogee Aquarium. Um, but as far as I can determine, the actual Coogee Carnival seemed to um, date from about 1916. I haven't found anything earlier. And if someone knows anything more about earlier history of the carnival, um, specifically the carnival that was um, uh, organised by the St John Ambulance Randwick Coogee Division, uh, and that was, um, again, set up as a fundraiser to assist with um, fundraising associated with the work that they performed to do with um, return service personnel, et cetera, and to do with the First World War. Um, so that was the first one, 1916, as far as we know. And uh, there's quite, uh, newspaper reports would suggest that uh, it wasn't all that different from what had happened later on. There was lots of light, lots of activity, um, and there were, um, groups of shows and showmen um, doing doing different things, the kinds of things that you expect that I guess would happen at the Royal East to show. The only thing that um, was a bit of a downer was afterwards uh, they had made seven hundred pounds, which is a lot of money really from the to the time um, that it was said. I don't know if this was true, but it's certainly in the newspaper that the council, the Randwick Council, was wanting a little bit more of a share of the money that had been made, um, and it was claimed in the uh, the newspaper of the day that uh, they wanted it to repair. Uh, roads. Now, I don't know whether they did get some money. I would have to go through the council minutes and find out. But anyway, it didn't deter um, the activities and they continued up and well up until the 1980s. But there were a few controversies along the way um, and a few things that sort of happened and were discussed. Um, and some things didn't go so well. Uh, in 1919, there was a balloonist called Captain Penfold. Now he was uh, used to jump out of uh, out of a I think I must have been a larger a larger um, balloon and he would parachute down to the ground. Now he unfortunately didn't get high enough in his balloon and when he parachuted down, the um, the parachute didn't open in time and he broke his leg. Uh, so that was one activity. The Monkey Speedway is something that I'd love to know if anyone else can tell me about that because I have done a bit of a hunt and although I've found a number of references to Monkey Speedways, I haven't really found an awful lot about it, even though I've asked quite a number of people. But apparently they, the monkeys sat in little racing cars and went round and round in circles. So anything, I'd love to hear more ideas about that. And that continued certainly until the 1930s. Um, in 1921, they said no more, no more carnivals, only paltry returns. However, it continued. Um, in 1928, a man called Edward Robert Marie was fined for racing goats harnessed to light gigs or racing sulkies. Um, and that was uh, in breach of the Dog and Goat Act. In 1934, um, there was, I, it sounded like fun. There was a man standing on a platform and people threw balls 
uh, not at him exactly, but at something behind him. And that would then, if they were successful, that would then cause him to fall into um, a big, uh, a giant bucket of water. Um, now that was described as being barbarous, inhum inhuman and uncivilised. Um, in 1941, there was a fireworks display just before the um, uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, 1942, um, there were uh, references in the newspaper to um, the that they hadn't, uh, they were still using bright lights, which were visible out to sea. 1954, there was a ban on a billy cart derby or derby at uh, at the Coogee Mardi Gras. So lots of lots of things happening. Um, and the Randwickham District Historical Society has some lovely photos from 1918 showing uh, what it looked like. Um, and it's great to see the costumes, those who are interested in that, but also to see that, you know, even though it's 1918, it's more than 100 years ago, it's very recognisable as a carnival. Um, and there's a merry-go-round, lots of stalls, more stalls going up the beach there. Now, on the 1st of January, it was a terrible tragedy. And this is really one of those things that uh, when I have read about it, and every time I read about it, I feel distressed, as distressed as, or perhaps not as distressed as the people who experienced it, but it is quite frightening. Um, and uh, it had been uh, promoted as being such a fantastic event that it was going to mark the centenary of the Randwick municipality. Um, and the Sydney Morning Herald of the 2nd of, of January provided a very a graphic account um, and saying that the wheel fell with a roar at 9.05 p.m., shocking the 3,000 people at the carnival. The report added that there were about 50 people on the Ferris wheel when it collapsed and crashed to the ground. Eyewitnesses reported that it appeared to hover for a second before plunging to the ground narrowly missing nearby stalls and tents. Uh, Tony Squires, in his 1988 article, said, when Frolic turns to panic, and that was the title of his article, and he included quotes from um, a number of the contemporary accounts and from people who actually were reported in the Herald of the Day. And Jan Boris said, I whirled around and screamed. Um, the wheel, ablaze with a hundred lights, was almost stopped and was swaying slowly. I knew it was going to fall. I was hypnotised. Slowly it began to totter and people began screaming. Down it fell from a, sick, a sickly, horrible thud. A whirlpool of dust was swirling up and through it all were the terrible screams of the injured. Um, the, the accident um, was widely reported, not just in the Herald, the Canberra Times also um, reported, they um, said that there was a crowd of 5,000 at the Mardi Gras, I suspect something between the two was correct, um, but that the crowd was stunned into silence, shattered only by the screams of the injured beneath the wreckage. Um, fortunately, uh, there weren't that many people caught underneath the wreckage, um, it, it was quite extraordinary that there weren't, um, I mean, there were a lot of people injured, but it wasn't quite as bad as it could have been. Peter Drew of Kingsford said, I was one of the, uh, in one of the cars, 20 feet from the ground, when I saw a blue flash from the machinery at the base. One of the operators threw a lever and, um, the, uh, the support of the wheel buckled and the structure toppled to the ground. It fell slowly at first, but soon speeded up and hit the ground with a terrible crash. Um, so it was a terrible, terrible event. And those that were injured critically were taken to hospital. The newspapers of the day, uh, as I said, um, reported in quite graphic detail. In the end, there were two people who died. Um, directly um, from the, the, uh, the collapse of the Ferris wheel. Mrs. Catherine Margaret Waller, um, she died in hospital a few hours later. The second victim um, was a man called uh, Roy Loomis, or Lummis. He died in February of um, 1959. Um, the, the ambulance officer that I spoke about um, apparently 
uh, he died um, a couple of years later, but from his uh, from the impact of what he'd experienced. Um, now, these are some wonderful photos um, showing the uh, people being assisted, being carried, a child being carried. Um, and the, there was um, the St John's Ambulance people were in attendance, thank goodness. And there were other people too who were in attendance and able to help with the injured. Um, and this was a listing of the names of all the people and the hospitals that they were taken to. And um, there were a couple of things that I wanted to just point out there, uh, things which today you certainly wouldn't see. And the, that is the names and the addresses of the victims. Um, it just shows how much our attitudes about privacy have changed over the years. And uh, we've even got the exact address. Now, um, I don't think there's any uh, at the time, obviously, that was the accepted thing. Uh, but it is um, wonderful for research purposes to look at the names of the people who were injured. Um, and to certainly in terms of local history and, and family history too, people doing their own family history. You'll notice uh, that there wasn't, um, there weren't a group of people taken to the Prince of Wales Hospital. Um, at that time, it was an annex to the Sydney Hospital. So it's not listed separately. Um, okay. And you'll notice there, um, Robert Waller, uh, from Vicar Street, and he was probably the son of Mrs. Waller who died. And here are some uh, cuttings again from the uh, from the newspapers uh, of the day, um, recounting people's comments and how they felt watching the whole thing collapse. Now. This newspaper cutting, and I don't expect that I've, I'll come to some of the salient points of it, but it's um, one of those really great articles because it catches immediately what the issues were. Now, uh, when I've gone through newspapers on Trove, there are quite a few stories of Ferris wheels collapsing, and there were certainly some that collapsed after 1959. Um, but what the article identifies is that basically there was no safety check needed to operate, as it says there, amusement machines. Um, there were requirements under the Scaffolding and Lifts Act um, in relation to other types of uh, lifts in particular and scaffolding, of course. Um, but they identified with that awful, the awful accident, identified um, a big gap in what had happened. Um, councils had been given, um, uh, they had received a circular that said that uh, um, the control of entertainment devices at past, pastoral and agricultural shows uh, was, uh, it was said that, the, that local government was responsible. Um, like councils, I think, questioned that. Um, the, uh, there was no act, there was no legislation, state legislation, um, and uh, that the um, department under secretary of the chief secretary's department said that his government, his department, I should say, had no control over the operation, um, merely issues permits for the games of chance, etc. So it was devastating because of the accident and devastating because people realised that such a terrible thing could happen and that there were there was just um, no legal, at that point, no, no legal, um, no breach of, of law. So um, the key issues that came out of that newspaper and that were identified is that the things like the Ferris wheels weren't licensed, they weren't tested for um, soundness of construction, um, there was no loading, um, nothing to say how many or how few people could be um, could be on them. Uh, they weren't obliged to be covered by insurance. It turns out that um, the operator of the Ferris wheel was covered by insurance. Um, that uh, councils did have a discretionary power to regulate uh, the operation of things like Ferris wheels, but no council had used the power. And um, that uh, the Minister for Local Government and Industry, um, Mr JJ Marnie, said that it was obvious now that the government had to look into the matter. 
And I will say that the New South Wales government did move very quickly once um, the issues had been identified. So where did the responsibility lie? Um, it, there was, it, it lay nowhere because ultimately um, what the Minister for Local Government, sorry, for Labor and Industry said that the government will see that these mechanical devices are subject to some supervision and control where there's an element of danger. Um, and that they will need to amend the legislation. And anyone that's ever had scaffolding erected around a, a building site at home or elsewhere will know that they, the, um, the scaffolding has to be checked. So now the inquest, because there were two deaths, there was an inquest held into the accident. Um, and there was evidence taken from a number of people who were witnesses and either there on the night. Um, or in the case of Mr McFadden, he was from the department. Now, the file is, is very interesting. It includes a lot of photographs and a lot of diagrams and a lot of evidence. Um, it, it doesn't, it, it's not, it's distressing to read because of the information that it deals with, but in itself, it's not a, a distressing file, thank goodness. Um, so I'll just, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the contents of the file. One of the things that I wanted to firstly highlight um, was that um, Leslie Lennon, who was the man who operated the Ferris wheel, gave um, a statement to the Randwick Police, and that is included in the file. Uh, he also, uh, there is evidence in the inquest file that he gave at the actual inquest. But um, I wanted to highlight here, that um, he said that he's, uh, he had built the, the um, elsewhere, he said that he built the Ferris wheel in his backyard. He's personally operated it at carnivals and shows in country districts and metropolitan districts. Um, he's inspected the, um, the wheel himself um, and uh, he's made frequent inspections of the axle and the lubricating parts of the, of the wheel that he erected um, the Ferris wheel at Coogee, um, where the Mardi Gras was to be held. And that he, again, he says he um, inspected the axle, washed it with, and the bearings with kerosene and repacked them with grease. And it began operating on the 26th. And as we know, of course, on the 1st, it collapsed. He does um, say it in his statement that he had an insurance policy, which um, thank goodness, I think, um, for the break previous, um, and he's never had, he said he'd never had breakages or breakdowns. So there were two items that uh, I wanted just of, uh, of evidence that I just wanted to highlight. Um, and one of them was from a fellow called Richard Carroll. And he said that um, as it fell, it started to tilt sideways. That seems to be consistent. And certainly it's consistent with the information in the inquest file. He was hit on the head. I don't know, obviously not too badly, not knocked out anyway. Um, and certainly he said he wasn't concussed. Um, his sister had her foot caught and he was able to extricate her, thank goodness. Um, uh, Frederick Collins was an ambulance officer who was actually on duty down at the, at the Mardi Gras. He he describes seeing it falling towards him. Um, he it fell clear of him, and he uh, saw someone pinned to the ground. Went and he assisted her, and he also saw um, a woman who had um, broken the compound fracture on the leg. So a lot these people would have been among the forty admitted to the various hospitals across Sydney. Now the photographs in the inquest file show. Uh, the collapsed Ferris wheel. And you can see that despite the fact that it collapsed, it didn't hit those tents around that, thank goodness, it didn't hit all of those. It was bad enough, but it's it, 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 it just amazing that I can't say anymore, it's just extraordinary luck. But it looks so flimsy and that's what's so frightening. I, that's what I found when I looked at it. It looks like um, little more than... Uh, hills hoist for those who remember what they look like um, you can see there how it's bent uh, you can see again the collapse the bent 
there again, there again. Now these are the diagrams in the file and um, it just shows how the breakage occurred. And I find that it, it's quite interesting just being able to see that and then it, it just falls down. But what they were able to identify when they looked at the Ferris wheel, and it was probably just like uh, those examinations that we see when um, forensic people come and look at scenes where there have been accidents or crimes, indeed, um, and they identify um, what explanations for why things have happened. And they were able to identify that that was the fatigue break on the shaft and that showed where the inner shaft had shown up, had come through, that um, the whole thing was just waiting, was an accident just waiting to happen, unfortunately. Now, Mr. McClelland was the man from the Department of Labor and Industry. Now, the people who were at the, at, at the um, uh, inquest, um, a lot of them had legal representatives um, and they were, were in particular, uh, Mr. Lennon did. Um, and the question was, that was put to McClelland, uh, because he was, after all, an expert, um, was put by McClelland, I should say, uh, to McCudden, Edmund McCudden, uh, because he was an expert witness. And he says, if this contraption had been examined by a competent engineer prior to the accident, would it have been apparent to him, I like that, but you know, we'll move on from that without x-rays, that an, an axle of these dimensions would, have, would be inadequate to the task and that this axle was ins insufficient to the task. And McCudden says, if I myself were to look at it, that's his question, yes, without further tests, would it be obvious to your naked eye? And his answer, if I saw the axle, I would consider it suspect and I would carry out calculations. So the full statement is in the file, but that was um, quite damning evidence. Now, um, this is a document. They also got um, the Department of Supply, someone from the Department of Supply, a chap called Sinclair, um, and that was the Commonwealth Department who also um, provided expert advice. And he said the failure of the axle shaft had been due to the development in service of a fatigue crack at the toe of the fillet weld attaching to the shaft to the end plate. Technical for me, but I understand failure of the axle shaft and the fatigue crack. So when it came to actually delivering um, the, uh, the finding of the inquest, there was no doubt. The bench, and this is the finding, oh, it was the coroner um, sitting, uh, one coroner sitting in alone on the evening of the 1st of January last when some sort of carnival then in progress, clear in the vicinity of the Ferris wheel being conducted and operated by Mr. Lennon and there were bystanders or persons on the ground close to the Ferris wheel, clear, sorry, uh, bystanders or persons on the ground close to the Ferris wheel, clear evidence of the axle of the fer ferris wheel broke causing the structure to collapse and so causing injuries to decrease and it would seem to others who were struck by the ferris wheel when co collapsing the reason for the collapse seems to be on the evidence of mr mccudden and the documents put, put before the court that the ferris wheel was put together and manufactured by lennon himself and at no time was it subjected to any examination by a competent person that the Ferris wheel failed to carry out its purpose of revolving these people around in the cars attached to it and so caused these deaths, the two deaths. The wheel was incapable of carrying out its intended task and was always a potential danger to those travelling. So on the basis of that, um, the... Um, the sorry, the state government um, set about um, changing the legislation. There were also a number of court cases because poor, people actually sought then to claim against the insurance policy that Lennon had. Um, and um, the, uh, the court cases, and it's, it's interesting, on the um, Randwick Council's uh, website, there's a timeline and it talks about um, the three sisters who were injured um, in the uh, on the Ferris wheel, 
and they were awarded um, 1,200 pounds in damages. Um, the Sydney Morning Herald also talks about the same uh, court case and again mentions the 1,200 pounds. There's also a letter in the inquest file um, from um, what now Mrs Lloyd, but she was at the time Miss Margaret Ann Hudson, who was injured in the Ferris wheel collapse. So there were plenty of people making claims against the insurance and he admitted liability. I suppose he had no option but to admit liability. Um, I'm not going to read the page from Hansard, but it was a lengthy um, discussion about the need to amend the legislation so that the um, scaffolding lifting lifts and scaffolding legislation would be covered by um, would, would include the ferris wheels from now on um, so that um, it would ensure that you would hope at the very best that it, the kind of accident that there would be some prevention um, that it wouldn't happen again. Now, we hope that that's the case, but of course, I know that when I went through Trobe, there were other accidents. Um, and uh, I don't know, I'm presuming there were, there were court cases involved, that, uh, but it said that basically um, the responsibility went to the Department of Labor and Industry, um, uh, which is at present entrusted with the administration of safety legislation generally, and uh, that it would be entrusted uh, with the control of amusement devices. Now, I suspect, because I've spoken to people who know about these things, that there was a bit of discussion at the time, um, a lot more than just simply seems to appear when you read through the Hansard um, discussion about um, what had happened, um, about the measure of uh, blame, because there was a lot of blame. Obviously, blame could be apportioned um, anywhere and everywhere, as, as happens when there's a death and when people have been injured and when there are court cases. Um, so it, uh, when I spoke to someone who used to work in the Department of Labor and Industry, he told me that it was a very distressing time for everyone involved because, of course, that department was probably also blamed. Um, but the legislation did pass. Um, it was approved by State Cabinet on the 1st of September 1959 um, and uh, it was uh, became law, was assented to on the 25th of March 1960. There seems always to be a slight delay but um, that was quite quick I think. They did actually um, go through the process which is required with changes to legislation fairly promptly but as I said I know that it was quite a fraught, um, certainly quite a fraught um, history. Um, now that is the end of my talk. I'm very happy to take questions um, and answer if I can. And if I don't, if I don't know the answer, I'm very happy um, to uh, to find out the answer. So I'll stop sharing, and uh, you can come back to to Georgina. Hello, Georgina. Yes. Thanks, Christine. That was marvellous. I really enjoy this presentation because it just uh, shows to everyone how you can use primary resource material to flesh out local history and find the answers to um, long held questions and actually verify what did happen. Um, so I just find it fascinating. So there are a few questions in the chat. Um, I had always wondered why the council's box of slides of the 1959 centenary celebrations did not include the Kuji Mardi Gras, but um, your research has informed me as to why that would be. They sort of started off with the big procession in February down Coogee Bay Road to the beach um, that had floats and very colourful floats from local industry, surf clubs and everything. So thank you um, for explaining why we wouldn't be having slides of um, what was a, a, a very, um, people loved the Mardi Gras and it's still uh, spoken about with great fondness. So your um, quotation from Frolicking to Panic, I think uh, probably sums it up really. Um, but we have a few questions in the chat from the audience. The first one was, um, uh, was 1959 the first time there was a Ferris wheel at the carnival? No, no, there were in, in the 1930s, um, interestingly, um, not the um, the truth 
um, a wonderful newspaper. The truth of uh, 8th of January 1933, in fact, said that there were two big attractions at the, uh, at, the, the at, at that stage, it was called the Carnival. The name Mardi Gras, I think, was um, probably started being used certainly by 1954. So I'm not sure exactly when it went from the, the, uh, the use of the word carnival to, to Mardi Gras. However, um, the two big attractions were the Ferris wheel and the famous ra racing monkeys. So um, certainly as early as, uh, as 30, as 1933. And I can't, um, I'm not sure, I don't think there was um, anything in, that, in those photos. Um, we could go back and have a look to see if you like, I could go back and um, open up the talk and uh, and just see if um, if there were any photos in 1918 of the Mardi okay. Gras. Would you like well, me to do that? If if you can find them, and I'll yeah. um, because a, a few of the other questions I think could be answered by those slides that have yeah. the okay. dimensions. Well, well, I'll, just, um, I'll go back. Uh, where, where people are asking about whether the how high the Ferris wheel and what the dimensions of the Ferris wheel were. Uh, As well, you said, that did look fairly flimsy, like a hill's yes. hoist. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how high. I could probably find that out by going. I couldn't tell you offhand now, but I could probably go through the um, inquest file and give you that information. Ah, yeah. so here we are, 1918. There was a Ferris wheel, and it looks, gee whiz, it looks very, 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 very much like a hill's hoist, doesn't it? Um, I was actually wondering if it was the same Ferris wheel uh, all those I years don't later. Think well, it's that's uh, 41 years on. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think so. Um, um, Leslie Lennon didn't look to be that old. So he said that he constructed the one that, that collapsed in 1959. He said he, he'd um, um, assembled that in his, in his backyard. So I don't think it's the same one, no. No. Okay. So, um, um, yeah. And there's another question. How was the hairline fracture visible to the naked eye? Well, I only know by reading uh, what was in the report, but I suspect that what they did was take the, the mechanism apart mm -hmm. and uh, they examined it, I think, um, piece by piece. That would be what I would have assumed, trying to determine exactly how the accident did happen. And uh, it's, I'm, I'm imagining that it was in the, 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 the mechanism that made it turn. That was where... Um, where the hairline fracture it wasn't necessarily and I don't believe that it was on the the bits that, around, that made it go around it's more on the on the uh, mechanism that actually operated it to make it go around if you take my meaning so yes. that was yep. and um, it's there's no um, photo uh, in the inquest file none that I saw anyway that actually showed me the hairline crack they were all sketches that were made as part of the investigations. But there's um, a couple more sketches that were made showing um, how, the, um, how the, the, the metal had actually deteriorated. As you pointed out in the presentation, um, people's attitudes to privacy have changed a lot. And uh, if something like that happened today, people's home addresses wouldn't, certainly wouldn't be published in the Sydney Morning Herald. And this last question uh, that we have, but we have time for one or two more if you have one. Yeah. Um, Karen asks, where did Roy Lummis live? I grew up in Como West and Lummis owned the grocer, green grocer there. Um, I thought one of their children died in the Ferris World Collapse at the Easter show around that time. And mm. I wondered if this is the same incident. And this probably goes to what I was speaking about uh, that oral history in families is sometimes has to be uh, uh, confirmed or research has to be done, which you have done into this uh, subject matter. You leave no stone unturned when it comes to the primary source material. So I'm actually wondering if this is um, the same incident that Karen saw. No, I don't, it's not show. the same incident. Um, oh. he, he lived at Guildford, um, I have his address, but you know he lived at Guildford. Um, no, it it was uh, when you go through if you go onto Trove and you can just go through looking under Ferris wheel. Um, it wasn't uncommon, unfortunately, sadly, um, which in some ways is surprising that no action was taken before 
the accident of 1959. So I don't, um, I don't believe that the um, Ferris wheel that was there in 1918 was the same one. Um, and Guildford, well, I mean, perhaps the person who died or was injured, the child who was injured at the Easter show, it could have been a connection. Um, I, I don't know very much about or, or anything really about Leslie um, Lennon I, I, um, to know exactly whether that was the end of his um, career um, operating these Ferris wheels or whether um, he continued. I, we, I have... Um, I haven't tried to find because in a way I find it uh, myself actually a little bit a bit distressing and I think um, it's uh, it's a sad enough incident that uh, I think best left through the official records but certainly you can go through and um, and read um, the comments that he said and he he in the end as I said he acknowledged that um, he it was his fault he had no no question about that really after the evidence. Um, those who are um, technically minded, and you can go through, you'd have to go out to Kingswood to the State Archives, but you can go through the file. Um, it is open to public access. It's not a closed document. And, uh, and read the details um, of exactly what was wrong and exactly the details of that break um, and to, to understand better. Um, I think the thing that, which is... Um, which is distressing, I suppose, when I when I look at it, is that um, the fact that uh, the 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 mechanism that one little mechanism broke, one little me one mechanism broke, and that caused the whole structure to to collapse. And um, it certainly, uh, I I found that the most frightening thing, I think, of all of it, that had it just simply stopped operating, and then people were caught perhaps up high and they'd have to have been brought down. And I will find out, um, and Georgina, I will send you, if, if it's in the file, the, exactly the height. It was very high, though, quite high. Um, I'm not sure, so I don't want to guess now of how many metres or, or yards they would have been in those days, but how many metres it was, but, yeah. Okay, so if the person who's asking that question um, can <coughs> privately contact us, we will uh, pass on that information. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, there's a few more if you if you boys can. Um, yeah, no, sure. That's very to it. Um, <laughs> um, Councillor Kathy Nielsen of Randwick Council is online with us tonight. Welcome, Councillor Nielsen. Hello, um, Kathy. Uh, we she's asked what got you started on this project. Well, it was funny. Someone, um, a colleague, actually uh, used to have a look at going through um, inquest files, looking for interesting stories. And um, he said to me, oh, gosh, did you hear about this one, about this terrible accident at Coogee? And I said, no, well, I didn't grow up in Coogee. So um, I said, no, that's fantastic. And when I got the file out and actually had a look at it, I thought that's extraordinary. But also I, I had myself used to enjoy going to the Mardi Gras at Coogee, mm -hmm. which operated well into the 80s. It used to be a great treat to go down um, around about Christmas if we were having dinner or, you know, down that towards the beach and you'd go I used to go on the rides and the dodging cars and all of that yeah. so it um, it actually I could sort of understand and as they say it resonated with me when I uh, when I read this about this dreadful accident and the fact that although it is a long time ago um, it's still within living memory for a lot of people um, and I thought well it's something that I should write up and try and document a little bit um, because it, it is an important part of our local history. Yes, it is. And I think you've answered the next question as well in that answer. Uh, was 1959 the last carnival? So mm -hmm. we've had that. Um, a lot of people that I meet at the library remember it quite fondly. And as you said, it went into the 80s at, um, uh, in different guise, probably. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's a question again about the Ferris wheel. Was it electric or petrol powered? Now that's, I think it must have been, um, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to find the answer to that because I had assumed elect electric, um, but it may, it may have been petrol, but I, I, will, I will check on that as well. Um, this is great. This is good to get questions that I don't know the answer to, actually. Um, so I'll find the answer to that as well. Um, 
it certainly in, in 1918, um, I know that's not what you asked me, I mm. suspect it would have been petrol powered then um, because electricity, it, it wouldn't have been as easy to, to wire it up to the devices. But it is possible, I suspect, that in 1959 it was electric, but I will find the answer. Okay, so these people who've asked these questions, if you can email, contact us at Randwick nsw.gov.au and uh, we will get in touch with you when Christine has an answer for you. So yeah, thank cool. you. Thank you for that. Um, there's only one homework. more. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it might keep you a little bit occupied if we've put it that way. Well, that's um, right. It couldn't have uh, happened at a better time. <laughs> yes. Yep. Um, so we've got another question about uh, what was the final Mardi Gras year? I'm not sure we know exactly, uh, but we went late, into the I 80s. Think it's certainly, um, certainly by the, well, the middle 80s, it was 1980s, it was going, but I think certainly towards the late 80s, it had stopped. And I'm not, um, I couldn't find quickly an answer to that. And interestingly, uh, even the, the most recent history of Randwick doesn't give anything that to indicate the date, but I think um, it was towards the late 1980s. Okay, um, Deb is asking um, if there's a record of the person who took the photo that you showed from the Historical Society's collection from a height. And then she said she thought it was for the time quite an innovative um, photographic angle. Um, so she just maybe when the Historical Society and all of us are out of lockdown, Deb can uh, come and have a look at the yes, they, collection. Yes, they are. They're lovely photos. Mm. They could have been taken from a balloon because um, hot air ballooning was, was certainly popular at the time and uh, the fellow who tried to parachute out of one, so that was 19, 1919. So it is, it is quite possible that it was from a balloon or it could have been from one of the buildings um, in mm. the vicinity. Mm. Uh, I noticed area. in one of one of your articles that referenced uh, Ocean Park at Coogee. Um, yeah. And uh, so I've learned something tonight about uh, former names. I, I just love my job because you learn something every day, as I'm sure you do as yeah. well. So yeah. um, that's really good. Um, right. We have someone saying thanks a lot. Um, and uh, Councillor Nielsen again, uh, do you know who owned the carnival? It was at that stage. It was um, it, it was run by the um, St John's Ambulance. Uh, later on, the council took it over in the seventies. I found an article that said in the seventies the council took it over. The council allowed the the, um, the St John's Ambulance because and and they allowed the event to be to take place there. Um, obviously by agreement um, and by application, they allowed that to happen. Um, but it wasn't a council event till the 70s, apparently. Um, and um, the even though councils, you know, this is going to be a great event in, in the newspaper articles talking about it, um, it seems to have been run certainly by the St John's Ambulance, but I think a number of other charities in the area because it was a great fundraiser and the money that was raised uh, was um, used for a number of the charities in, in, in Randwick and in the municipality, um, including the St John's Ambulance, but not only the St John's Ambulance. Um, and it had evolved over time from being um, an effort to raise money for the during the First World War for various um, things to assist um, with the Red Cross, etc., and the war chest even. I found one reference to the war chest. Um, but later on, the, um, it, the charities extended across, across the board. Okay. Um, so uh, there's one here. Um, was Leslie Lennon charged at all from Elizabeth? I, I don't think he was. Um, and I haven't found anything that said he was. But um, the, the thing that's the most frustrating is that, of course, Trove really uh, doesn't give you anything. The, the Sydney newspapers after 1954, unless you go onto um, the State Library's um, e-resources. But when I've searched, because it does pick up the Canberra Times, I haven't found anything to suggest that he was charged. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean that he wasn't. 
but I've never seen any reference to it. And no one's ever told me that he, that he was. I was speaking to um, a couple of former showmen who, only because I was asking about the monkey cars, actually, the monkey racing cars, and uh, they knew uh, Leslie um, Lennon's name, but they didn't say to me that he'd been charged. Um, but that's, um, you know, that's something else that might um, come through later, but nothing that I have found so far. I actually wondered uh, whether the Worth Circus, the family living in Coogee, had anything to do with it. Well, but, I wondered mm. that too, but I was told probably not. I yeah. should say too that the the um, had he was he if he had been going to be charged, that would have been a recommendation by the coroner, and that wasn't um, the uh, the recommendation from the when the from the uh, the coroner's findings. So that would suggest that he wasn't charged I would I would suggest okay there's one or two more um Lee recalls the Lions Club uh having a lot to do with the Mardi Gras in the 70s when she attended with her mother and I have to actually do a shout out uh, to anyone in attendance today who does have photos of them and their family at the Mardi Gras I think it would be great to copy them uh, for posterity. So again, reach out to the uh, library and we can facilitate that when we're back in person. Um, Judith Neville from the Randwick and District Historical Society Executive says, thank you, Christine, very interesting talk. And there's another one or two along those lines. So I think um, if no one else uh, has a burning question, we will get back to those people with the answers if we can. Yes, um, I will. I will. And um, uh, yes, and I, I'll certainly, um, uh, I might pursue um, Leslie Lennon's um, family history a little bit more because um, the fact that there was another, someone um, injured um, with the same surname, that's just a coincidence probably, but um, that it would be interesting to know what happened to him afterwards. Um, I've tended, I, I, so I always think with some of those things, it, 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 it tell the story as it is and rather than going too, too much to try and uh, take it beyond that point. But since people have asked, I will pursue that a little bit more. And uh, certainly those, uh, those questions, I'll go try and find the answer to those as well. Okay, that would be great. Thank you for that. Um, so it only remains to me to thank you very much for joining us this evening and thank Christine, who, as you can see, is a marvellous um, historian and has fleshed out the history of a much loved event in uh, Coogee in our local history. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge and your passion, uh, Christine. It's, um, it's marvellous what you've done. And I'm sure it has been a trip down memory lane uh, for those who used to go to the Mardi Gras, maybe in de decades subsequent to this event. Um, but all of us can learn from um, the valuable lessons of history.